represent a serious problem of white collar crime, and they affect a large number of victims, in some cases all members of society, and they invoke costs of demoralization. We lose trust in people and organizations. A single scam can cost taxpayers and investors billions of dollars. It can destroy companies and the livelihoods of individuals and families. Business ethics examines the ethical principles and moral or ethical problems that arise in a business environment. It applies to all aspects of business conduct and is relevant to the conduct of individuals and entire organizations. As a result of unethical business conduct, we have seen an exponential growth in laws and regulations governing business activities. Such a reliance on government involvement should be considered cautiously. The political landscape, as we know, is fraught with its own issues of unethical conduct and leadership. Legal behavior does not necessarily equate to ethical behavior. In a desire to better understand unethical business conduct, sociologist Donald Cressy spent his career studying occupational related crimes. He's credited with the theory of the fraud triangle. The three pronged factors he identified as integral to occupational fraud are incentive pressure, pressure, the motive for committing the fraud, rationalization, the way in which the offender rationalizes his or her actions, and opportunity, the system or other internal organizational weakness that the offender identifies that provides the opening for the unethical conduct. Generally, offenders start small and gain confidence over time. Unethical conduct involves a choice. We all have experienced conversations where we have heard, I have no choice. In fact, maybe we've been the person to say that. It's a common sentiment to express when we're faced with a tough decision, particularly one that has ethical implications or consequences that we're not entirely comfortable with or feel defensive about. Claiming that we have no choice in such circumstances allows us to feel better about our choices, helps us feel less responsible for them and their consequences. It's a way to pacify our discomfort and our sense of guilt. But this reflects our human fallibilities and vulnerabilities. Choice is essential to ethics. There is no way to act ethically or unethically without also making a choice. The idea that we have no choice is itself a choice. It's easy to listen to stories where effective leaders describe ethical dilemmas and provide a roadmap for resolving the dilemma. That's helpful. It gives us a warm and fuzzy feeling and provides us a vision of our ideal selves in difficult situations. We want to believe that when faced with an ethical dilemma, we will choose what is right amidst other available choices offered to us. But in order to achieve our ideal, we must understand our own personal vulnerabilities. G.E. Moore, a British philosopher, became well known for his advocacy of common sense concepts. And he emphasized a concern for the identity of thinking. So in that vein, we must not only seek to understand what values and behaviors form the foundation of ethical conduct, but also seek greater insight into all variations of unethical behavior and types of offenders. In doing so, we further develop the critical skills, critical thinking skills, and base of awareness needed to understand such behaviors and offenses. It also provides us an insider's view into the American workforce, the international workforce, and the cultural underpinnings that are the foundation of values that drive workforce activities. And it helps us identify ideas for effective prevention and intervention systems. In a literature review of business ethics education, Terrence Bishop identified several key points central to success in understanding business ethics. It should be based on a solid liberal arts foundation 
where we develop a broad sense of humanity and critical thought process. It should reinforce our existing value system. It should focus on recognizing ethical issues and responding appropriately. And it should apply examples that cause us to consider decisions in light of our own beliefs. Further developing perceptiveness and analytical skills. In essence, it requires a balanced approach and one that is multidisciplinary in nature. We are pleased tonight that our speaker can contribute to our understanding of business <coughs> ethics. Please join me in welcoming Frank Becky. Tell me a man old, about 16, 
How far did you go in high school? 10th grade. How long have you? And I went to work for a small amount of money, a few hours a day, but I soon realized I couldn't support myself on that amount of money. I also realized that as long as people believed I was 16 years old, they weren't going to pay me any more money. At 16, I was six foot tall. I've always had a little gray hair. My friends in school said that once a week when I was dressed for mass, I looked more like a teacher than a student. So I decided to lie about my age. In New York, we had a driver's license at 16. Back then, they didn't have a photo on it, just an IBM card. So I altered one digit from the date of birth. I was actually born in April of 1948, but I dropped that four, converted it to a three, and that made me 10 years older, or 26 years old. I walked around applying for the same type of work. People gave me a little more money, a few more hours, but even then it was difficult to make ends meet. One of the few things I had taken when I left home was a checkbook. My father had opened a checking account for me at a small community bank in Mount Vernon, New York. I had a little money in the account, so every so often I would write a check to supplement my income. $10, $15, funds were there, checks were good. But it was my friends, my peers, who would say to me, you know, you're the only kind who walks into a bank in the middle of Manhattan. You have no account there. You don't know a soul. You talk to somebody behind the desk, and they okay your check. Oh, well, my checks are good. If I walked in that bank, they wouldn't touch my check. You walk in, they don't bat an eye. And years later, reporters would write and say that that was my upbringing, mannerisms, dress, appearance, Whatever it was, it was very easy to do, so consequently, when the money ran out, I kept writing those checks. Of course, the checks started to bounce. Police started looking for me as a runaway. I thought maybe it was a good time to start thinking about leaving New York City. But I was a little apprehensive about going to Chicago or Miami. Wondered if they'd cash a New York check on a New York driver's license in Miami as quickly as they did in Manhattan. I was walking up 42nd Street one afternoon about 5 o'clock in the evening, 16 years old pondering all of these things. When I started to approach the front door of an old hotel that used to be there, called the Commodore Hotel, now the Grand Hyatt. Just as I was about to get to the front door of the hotel, out stepped an Eastern Airline flight crew onto the sidewalk. Couldn't help but notice the captain, the co-pilot, the flight engineer, about three or four flight attendants, dragging their bags to the curb to load them in the van and take them to the airport. As they loaded the van, I thought to myself, well, that's it, I could pose as a pilot. I could travel the world for free. I could probably get just about anybody, anywhere to cash a check for me. So I walked up the street a little further to 42nd and Park. I went to cross over. I heard a huge helicopter and looked up and there was New York Airways standing on the roof of the Pan Am building. Pan Am, the nation's flag carrier, the airline that flew around the world. I thought, what a perfect airline to use. So the next day I placed a phone call to the executive corporate offices of Pan Am. When the switchboard was ringing, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say. When they answered, Pan American Airlines, could I help you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'd like to speak to somebody in the, um, somebody in the purchasing department. Purchasing? One moment. The clerk came on and said, yes, ma'am, you can help me. My name is uh, John Black. I'm a co-pilot with a company based out of San Francisco. Been with the company about seven years. Never had anything like this come up before. Now, what's the problem? Well, we flew a trip in here yesterday. We're going out today. Yesterday I sent my uniform out through the hotel to have it dry cleaned. Now the hotel and the cleaner say they can't find it. Here I am with a flight in about four hours. New uniform. Don't you have a spare uniform? We're going back home in San Francisco, but I never get here in time for my flight. Do you understand that this will cost you the price of a uniform, not the company? I understand. Hold on, I'll be right back. He came back and said, my supervisor says you need to go down to the well-built uniform company on Fifth Avenue. They're our supplier. I'll call them and let them know you're on the way. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to know. So I went down to the well-built uniform company. Little fellow, Mr. Rosen, fitted me out the uniform. Back then there were black gabardine and three gold stripes on the arm and gray hair. I certainly looked old enough to be the pilot. When he was all done, I said, how much do I owe you? Well, the uniform's $286. I said, no problem, I'll let you a check. No, uh, can't take it. Oh, well then I'll, um, I'll just pay you cash. Oh no, we can't accept cash. You need to fill out this computer card. Then in these boxes, put your employee number. And we bill this back in the uniform allowance. Comes out of your next Pan Am paycheck. Well, that's even better. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> we had two airports, LaGuardia and Kennedy. LaGuardia is 20 minutes from downtown.
downtown Manhattan. Kennedy is 50 minutes away, with Guardia being the closer of the two. That's where I went. Spent most of the morning walking around with Guardia in the uniform, trying to figure out now that I had the uniform, how the hell did he get on these planes? <laughs> but I got a little hungry about lunchtime, so I walked into luncheonette, sat down at the counter on a stool, and ordered a sandwich. Moments later, a TWA crew walked in. The flight attendant sat in the booth, pilots over the counter on either side of me, captain right next to me. Back before deregulation of the airlines, airline people thought of themselves as just one big family. They didn't hesitate a moment to talk to each other. The captain kind of leaned over. Hey, young man, how's Pan Am doing? Doing just fine, Captain. I mean, what's Pan Am doing out here at LaGuardia? Pan Am doesn't fly into LaGuardia, they only fly into Kennedy. Well, I picked up on that right away. <laughs> yeah, we came into Kennedy, had a short layover, came over to visit some friends of mine. Matter of fact, I'm on my way back to Kennedy now. So tell me, young man, what type of equipment are you buying? Now, airline people have a lot of jargon for things, and one of them is they never call a plane a plane or an aircraft, they call it equipment, and what type of equipment you're on in, what type of plane you fly back then, a DC-8, a 707. Of course, I didn't know that, and I thought, what type of equipment am I on? The equipment I'm on is a stool. <laughs> <laughs> they must mean what type of equipment is on the planes I fly. So I thought, well, I've got the wings and the engine. I always had a sticker on the engine, who manufactured the engine, so I said, yeah, it's General Electric. All three pilots kind of just stopped eating and leaned over. The captain said, oh, really? What do you fly? Washing machines? I know it's a <laughs> Everybody had an airline ID card, a plastic laminated card, much like the state driver's license today. And without the ID card, the uniform was worthless. Went back to Manhattan through the discouraged thinking, where would I come up with a Pan American airline corporate ID? I was sitting in a hotel room. I noticed a big, thick Manhattan yellow page so I pulled them down on the bed, flipped them open, and looked under the word identification. There were three or four pages of companies who made convention badges, metal badges, plastic badges, police badges. Started to call around, and finally one company said, listen, most of those airline IDs manufactured by Polaroid, 3M company, need to call one of them. Finally got the 3M company on the phone in Manhattan. Yeah, we manufacture Pan Am's identification system, along with a number of other carriers. How come? So today I'm a purchasing officer for a major U.S. carrier. I'm in New York just for the day. We're getting ready to expand our routes, hire a lot of new employees, go to a formal ID. We're very impressed with this Pan Am format when if I came by your office this afternoon, briefly, we could discuss quantity and price. By all means, come on by. So I went by dressed in a suit and sell the book and book. Yeah, we do United, Delta, Eastman, Pan Am, Pan Am. We like this Pan Am format. When if you have a sample I can bring back? Sure, I'll be right back. He brought me back a 5 by 7 glossy piece of paper with a picture of an ID card blown up in the middle of it. Someone else's picture in the picture. John Doe for a name. And in bold writing across the front, this is a sample only. I said, no, I'm afraid this one do you. I need to bring back an actual physical card. And by the way, what is all this equipment on the floor? Uh, we don't just sell this card. We sell the system, camera, laminate. I said, we have to buy all this? Absolutely. Well, tell you what, since we have to buy it, I wanted to just demonstrate how it works. So use me. Fine, I'll see you right here. <laughs> <laughs> I was walking down the elevator studying the car. It had a blue border across the top, about a quarter of an inch in the color of Pan Am's blue, but that was it. Not a single thing on the card said Pan Am. No logo, no insignia, no company name. This was a plastic card, like a credit card. You couldn't type on it, you couldn't write on it, you couldn't print on it. Discouraged, I put it in my pocket, headed back to the hotel. As I was walking back, I noticed I had passed a hobby shop, so I turned around and walked back. Excuse me, sir, I see you sell a lot of models here. You sell models of commercial jetliners? Sure, over there. So I bought a model of a Pan Am 707 cargo jet for about $2.30, <laughs> took it back to my room, opened the box, threw all the parts out, but there at the bottom of the box was a sheet of decals that went on the model. When you soak them in a glass of water, the little Pan Am logo, the blue globe that went on the tail of a plastic plane, went perfect on the top of the plastic card. And the word Pan Am in the special styling of graphics that would have went on the fuselage went perfect across the top of the card. And a clear decal on the laminated plastic made a beautiful identification card. Pan Am says they estimate that between the ages of 16 and 18, I flew more than a million miles for free, boarded more than 250 commercial aircraft in more than 26 countries around the world. Pan Am says, keep in mind that though Frank Abigail did in fact pose as one of our pilots, he never once stepped on board one of our aircraft. That's true. I never flew on Pan Am because I was afraid someone might 
might say to me, you know, I'm based in San Francisco. I've been out there 23 years. I don't recall ever meeting you before. Or someone might say, you know, your ID card is not exactly like my ID card. So instead, I flew on everyone else. If I wanted to go somewhere, I literally just walked out to the airport and looked on the board. United Flight 800 to Chicago. Then I went downstairs to the door marked United Operations and walked in. The operations clerk, hey, Pan Am, what can we do for you? I was wondering if the jump seat's open on 800. I need to dip into Chicago. Jump seat, it's open this evening. I'd like to get a piece of the guys. I'd give my ID, write down a pass, and walk out and the flight attendant. She'd open the door to the cockpit, and I'd step in. There had a captain, a co pilot, a flight engineer, and a seat behind me, captain, called the jump seat, where pilots did it on company time. Now, because pilots love to talk shop, once you picked up that jargon, it was the same conversation over and over and over. <laughs> if I had to step on board, you knew about the history right in Chicago. On the taxi out, always the same question. So, Bob, how long have you been with Pan Am? It's been flying about seven years. What position do you fly? A right seat, which is airline terminology for a co pilot. What type of equipment are you on? Had that one down. Perfect. <laughs> Matter of fact, whatever they flew, I didn't fly. So no problem with that. When we'd arrive in Chicago, I'd go buy the Pan Am ticket counter, but just enough to get the attention of the passenger service rep. Is so, it gonna help you? I mean, when do we lay over here? They did it at church with somebody got ill, never laid over in Chicago. Uh, we use the Carmen House Hilton downtown. Gotta catch a crew bus on the lower level over three out. I'd go down to Carmen House Hilton and walk in and on the corner of the registration desk was a little sign that said airline approves. That was a three-ring binder. You signed in, referenced your flight number, showed your ID, they gave me a key, I'd stay two or three days, and then would be direct billed from my room and my meals. I also could cash a personal check at the front desk up to $100 because I was an employee of the airline. The airline had a contract with the hotel, and they'd cash your check. But then I found out that every airline honors every other airline employs personal check, a reciprocal agreement still practiced today in 2012. So at the Sioux Falls Airport, Delta flight attendant can walk over to an American ticket counter and show the ID and cash a check up to $100 and vice versa. Of course, when I found that out, I'd go out to JFK or LAX, only I'd go to everybody, Northeast, National, KLM. <laughs> it take me a good eight hours stopping at every counter and every building. By the time I got all the way around the other end of the airport, at least eight hours had gone by. What do you have in eight hours? Ship change, new people, so I go all the way back. <laughs> Dr. Gordon was going through a divorce. 
just separated from his wife. He was very upset, very lonely. Every day on the way to the car, out to the pool, he'd stop me. And after a minute or two about the weather, he starts speaking medical terminology. Not being able to converse with him, I in turn would cut him short. But I knew eventually he'd get suspicious. Determined not to move, every day I went to Emory University's medical library. Every day I read the daily journals from Johns Hopkins, from the Mayo Clinic. Every day I'd take a certain part of the journal, memorize it to detail, and every night at 6 o'clock when Dr. Gordon pulled in his parking slot, this is without exaggeration now, every night I was on his doorstep. Hey, Doc, you about to snooze through the using of the mail? What is it tonight? And I'd follow him into his apartment. Aggravated, he'd go into the bedroom to get undressed. I'd go into his bedroom and sit on the edge of the bed. Be in the kitchen, I'd follow him back and forth. Be in the bathroom, I'd talk through the door. Pretty soon he'd come home. Hey, Doc, I don't have time to talk to you right now, I gotta go. The guy started to report, which is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> Next flight out is at 6.30 in the 